welcome back everyone to these aren't the nerds you're looking for podcast this is kevin hort here lorenzo Fon over here what up lorenzo not much uh just ready to get into some zillow beast my mind is still thinking if i made the right choice for bounty hunters which i think i did end up with the right choice speaking of bounty hunters i think <laughs> i figured out uh why maybe it falls in the chronology the way that it does uh yeah why is that so i think what it is is the ship that they are on when they fly to felucia Mm -hmm. that half moon shape disc frisbee yeah i'm trying uh, it's not a starfighter it's not a cruiser transport Shuttle, yeah. Shuttle, shuttle. Shut, it's a shuttle. Jedi shuttle. We'll go with. Yeah. Uh, so that's the only thing that I can see that like links from anywhere to anywhere else. And uh, as soon as I can remember what the name of that ship is, I was gonna look it up on Wikipedia and see if we see it anywhere else in in the Clone Wars. Because I'm thinking that it was like it was in this episode that has an anchor in the timeline and then there's this other floating episode that can kind of be wherever and starts out with the same with the same shuttle so they're like okay we'll just stick it right there boom there you go that makes sense no that makes perfect sense um yeah i agree with that explanation because yeah that really is the only link to the episode prior is definitely that that ship visually Mm -hmm. you know so that makes perfect sense it's it's about the only thing that connects it to anything else Uh, because we can get to that when uh, we get to the newsreel but let's enter the episode first we are uh, this is the 33rd adventure in the Clone Wars uh, chronology of episodes Uh, Zillow the Zillow Beast as you alluded to earlier season 2 episode 17 uh, production number 222 uh, episode 18, isn't it? Uh, uh yeah. You said 17? Yeah. <laughs> just double checking. Just catching you. I must have just so, really, really loved the bounty hunters, and that's why hunters. I was thinking about, uh, 17. But yeah, you're correct. <laughs> Season 2, episode 18. Uh, we've got a split air date on this as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the U.S. it was April 9th of 2010. Uh, in the UK, it was April 3rd, 2010. Mm-hmm. Directed by Giancarlo Volpe, or Volpe. Uh, written by Craig Titley. 2.22 million viewers. Very nice. We are still in the 21 BBY year timeline, whatever you want to say. Mm-hmm. So... Our fortune cookie this week is choose what is right, not what is easy. And I'm gi- I'm giving this one to Dumbledore. That is <laughs> that is that's where this one is going. That is know? that's very good. Uh, I don't remember <laughs> Jedi Dumbledore though. It's essentially the same thing. Um, beyond that, uh, I don't. This one was tough to pin down. Like this, I was just gonna toss this one towards Qui Gon, maybe. I picked Padme on this. Ooh, that's a good one. I think back to yeah. like your favorite line in cinema ever. So this is how democracy dies, right? Thunderous and, applause. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it just seems like you know it's pretty definitive. Like do what's choose what is right, not what is easy, and that's that's her shtick. Like when she, in. Uh, in Revenge of the Sith, when she's talking to Anakin and says something to the effect of, what if the Republic you have sworn t- to uphold is not the Republic that we knew or something? Basically, like, the good guys are becoming the bad guys because of the decisions they're making. And so mm-hmm. she decides to do what is right and stand up for what she actually believes in and not what is easy and stick with the masses of people that are just going along with uh, who will become Emperor Shivel, right? Mm-hmm. So that's my thought process behind this. That makes a lot of sense. I I will agree with that. Yeah, I'm gonna. Be, I didn't think that way at all, but as soon as you brought it up, 
I'm going to be honest with you, when I sit down to do research for these episodes, I look at those however many words worth of blue text, and I just pause it, and I sit there for hours and hours and hours, (laughs) and then the rest of it uh, is just flying by the seat of my pants, come what may, if you will. Yeah, nah. It's not entirely true. I I just essentially write it down. I don't even think about it at all like the newsreel is already running by the time i'm finished writing it <laughs> yeah i do a lot of i do a lot of pause and rewind and play mm-hmm. uh but i do put yep. some thought into into these fortune cookies so uh that's what i came up with so it's up to you if you want to go padme or dumbledore uh they're definitely different characters <laughs> different stature but uh, I haven't seen Different the the purple group. cloaked bearded man in the Clone Wars yet, so I'm sticking with Padme. Padme, Padme, it is. Padme, it is. Super. All right. What's happening in this newsreel here? This newsreel, I don't know because I didn't measure the length of it, right? But it feels mm-hmm. like it's a longer newsreel, and it really sets up what we have going on in the rest of the episode. Uh, I agree. It definitely seems wordier than usual. It seemed a little more in depth rather than, you know, Anakin and Ahsoka well, the got themselves into some fucking trouble, and here we go. Well, yeah. The last one was, like, so basic where it's like, Separatists are fighting the Republic. Like, no shit. We're in season two. Like, we we got this point. But it talks about right. uh, how this is the longest battle of the war so far. We're on Malastare. Uh, Mm -hmm. The big MacGuffin, if you will, is a fuel supply. I guess they harvest fuel on Malastare, so it doesn't really say that that's like... I don't know if the Separatists are there for the same thing. I mean, I would imagine so, right? Yes. And that's why this big battle is going on, because whoever wins is going to have the upper hand as far as fuel goes for... Mm -hmm the remainder of the war or until I guess the fuel runs out or whatnot. Uh, Cause even, even if the separatists don't need it in any case, they're going to block the Republic from having fuel. Right. Because the Republic does yeah. need it for sure. Yeah. The Republic for sure needs it that we know. So she wants the fighting to end. Uh, so he authorizes the use of what is called like the Republic's new weapon. Mm. which is an electro proton bomb. Yep. And uh, after that, we head to, we're still in the newsreel, we head to an Imperial Palace, which I thought was kind of weird, uh, but it's of Doge Urus, Urus, rather. Uh, and then we essentially have a countdown to boom. of The narrator calls it the Doomsday Device, which I thought was weird. Mm-hmm. It's odd. It's I feel like occasionally there's like an odd choice of words because this this series is presented as the clones being the good guys, but then occasionally the way that what they're doing, either described by the narrator or by the characters themselves, is portrayed in maybe not the best light. Like mm-hmm. calling this new weapon a doomsday device. Like when Mace Windu was calling their relief effort and invasion. Yeah. So I don't know if that is, uh, I don't know if that's done on purpose or if that is just the way that the writing staff crafts these episodes or if they want like those undertones or subtle little jabs that like, Hey, as Padme figures out, maybe the good guys aren't exactly who we think they are. Mm-hmm. So, I don't yeah, know. I uh, I also thought Doomsday Device was an odd choice of words, especially since we aren't quite sure what it does yet. So it kind of it it's definitely selling hard the the power of this weapon, mm-hmm. right? That we're just introduced to. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. It's 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 an interesting term, and also because. It's one thing for Mace to call an attack an invasion from their own side, but like, do we get the sense that the newsreel is supposed to be 
neutral or is it is it i mean it's it's this it's Ularin's the same voice actor as Ularin's so are we to yeah it's Tom ass- Kane yeah are we to assume that it's him or is it just a third party yeah i kind of thought it was more of like Walter Cronkite of space yes uh you know just giving an account of what's mm. going on in these clone wars yeah just trying to just provide factual information yeah yeah so like in the in this news reel the idea of a doomsday device sort of makes sense yeah i guess that would make sense i mean that would just be uh space cronkite having a you know his opinion bleeding through the the news mm-hmm. so i'm okay with it i'll go with it yeah yeah, that's kind of how I would read anything that appears in the newsreel. As for Mace calling his thing of invasion, I still don't know anything about that. Yeah. but Well, I think it's because Mace Windu didn't actually sign a contract to be on camera, so they got like a Mace stand-in, which is why he sounds different <laughs> than he should. And uh, that means he also acts a little different than he should. And he just doesn't like his his role in the war, perhaps, as well. He's got like his own take on you know getting inside the mind of mace <laughs> but he didn't watch snakes on a plane because that's all you need right and uh yeah so i think that i think that's what's up with that but <laughs> uh after the news reel we jump straight into the fight uh mm-hmm. rex is kind of ducked behind something talks about you know that's a lot of clankers and then i think maybe at this time it like pans across like he pulls up his viewfinder or whatever but uh we don't really have an a plot b plot in this thing instead what we do is we cut from fighting on the ground to kind of the command center Mm -hmm. which in the command center is mace windu anakin skywalker uh this guy dojiris and a hollow of sheev Mm -hmm. palpatine himself and uh there is a, another character, Dr. Bull. Yep. What is her first name? Uh, Sionver. Sionver. Yeah. yeah. Sionver. So, That's what I got. We, yeah, she's only referred to ever as Dr. Bull. Yep. So but, we'll have to... Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about her when we get there. Uh, but Rex talks about how many clankers there are because as we'll find out there are a shit ton of battle droids super battle droids and beyond Um, yeah it's a big old battle happening it's 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 quite a a sizable battle it is quite a sizable battle yeah to say the least doge sheave bowl and mace kind of have a conversation back and forth uh doge says he doesn't want his people to be slaves she is like that's not going to happen this bomb is going to fix it uh, the bomb is supposed to only affect droids. So we have the opposite of the defoliator here. Yes. And yep. um, this is built to take out electrical and leave organic and other. So Dr. Bull is there to, I guess because she's the one that invented this thing. So she's there to, to make sure everything goes off without a hitch. Uh she says, we have accounted for every probable outcome. May says, it's the improbable outcome that worries me. Uh, she was like, nope, everything's going to be good. This bomb is our only hope. Like, Yeah, his, his choice of words in saying that it's their last chance mm-hmm. is a little odd. I don't, I, I, I mean, I get that the fuel is important. Right. But, uh it's just at this point it's 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 maybe it's because i know how much longer this goes but it's it's really interesting that he thinks this is like a last stand for them well right yeah so i guess it's because without the fuel they're they're not gonna he knows that they have limited resources at that point mm-hmm. and they will simply not be able to outlast the droids that yes. with what with what resources the droid has droids have and the amount of fuel that they have on hand the droids can just simply wear them down they don't even have mm-hmm. to beat them necessarily they're just going to 
outlast them. Just let them. them go and surrender, yeah. Yeah. Just push them into surrender. Okay, that makes more sense now. <laughs> so. It's that, just, that was, as it's happening, the conversation's happening very quickly. For it sure. Is. It's chop, 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 back and forth, back and forth. Mm-hmm. Nope, this is the only thing. This is what we got to do. Yep. So, um, we're, we're, we cut back outside to some fighting. Like I said, there are a shit ton of droids. Uh, the clones are way outnumbered. There are dugs in this fight. That's kind of funny. Doge has some dugs in the fight. Yeah. And Lots of dugs. They're riding these things called insectomorphs, which are these kind of weird four-legged beasts. And their design, I think, is for function because... Uh, to describe what Dugs are, that's Sebulba from The Phantom Menace, right? Mm-hmm. The mean dude yep. that uh, with the dog-looking face. That pod that races. Yeah. Pod races and hates Anakin. Uh, so these the species walks on their hands, essentially. Like their upper limbs are what is on the ground. Mm-hmm. And then their spine kind of curves up and like holds their butt up, and then their lower limbs are their main. What do you call it? I don't know. They're like their hands. They're, yeah, their main like manipulation. Uh, yeah, appendages. I guess. Yes. We'll yeah. We'll call them that. Uh, which is weird because they have opposable thumbs on both their hands and their feet, be it their arm feet or their leg hands right whichever you want to call it but uh (laughs) so because because of the way that these things have like their spine curved and they're kind of designed backwards as far as which limbs reach the ground and which ones are there to manipulate the environment these insectomorphs i think needed to be kind of shaped funny because otherwise Mm -hmm. they wouldn't like they can't just sit on a horse yeah because they're arm legs wouldn't reach you know like stirrups or anything like it just wouldn't work out so uh the insectomorphs look weird but i think it's just a design of practicality so that they could put uh these dugs on some type of beast of burden yeah i think it's both that and evolutionary if you're going to have a creature like the dugs you have to have an environment that would also support other creatures like it like right? a, like a coevolution type type deal yeah, basically, you know, like the split between like chimpanzees and humans, per se, right? Mm, I was thinking this, like the split between uh, dachshunds and Great Danes, or that, right? I guess that's like. The but they're opposite, still, though. but they're still dogs, right? Right. Like you're still talking about two separate types of dogs, right? Whereas like chimpanzees and humans are different species, but they have, you know, evolutionary similarities, right? Gotcha. So that's kind of how I saw this. But yeah, it's it's an interesting design. Um but it was I thought it was clever to see kind of more into what's going on with uh the species that Sebulba is derived from, right? Mm, the dugs. Yeah, the dugs. Yep. Um so I was down for that. The one thing I did note that I found really funny during this battle is the like disc cannon that's that my the dugs have my next note is weird disc launchers yeah so they're really just giant like metal discs that they're just launching into the air and they'll hit whatever is flying above or, but how do you aim how do you calculate that or eventually they'll just like hit the ground yeah it's like a combination between uh like clay birds that people like when you shoot skeet like it yes. launches this little thing out that you're supposed to Just shoot a clay at, bird, right? yeah. And yep. uh, like, did you ever have a like a Hot Wheels ramp set where it's yes. got it's got like the spinny thing at the bottom, and you just like a car slides through it, and it just like fires it out it the other end. Pushes it through. Yep. It's kind of like a combination of those two things. I agree. Yeah, like it was between that and um. Oh, like the old like disc launchers that you'd kind of pull back and there'd be like a spring that would kind of lock in place and then you like the foam discs right yeah that one that one i i got nothing for you yeah like yeah. the foam disc guns that you know you could load in the top and uh 
they would just launch them out the front. Oh, okay. So I saw that too in it, but it was just it was an intre- This was an interesting weapon design, for sure. Because uh, if it misses target, I guess you could take out a swath of droids behind it. You know, on the ground. I you know. That's a good point because I think that maybe these things would be more effective if they were like fired horizontally, just like straight across, like straight, a, a yeah. Field of, yeah. But then it, these discs definitely seemed affected heavily by gravity, like right. They weren't the laser fire that mm-hmm. sh- goes straight infinitely. So I feel like even if you're trying to, you you would still have to shoot it as if it were a cannon. Like a cannonball, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of like a cannon arc. frisbee. Yes. But then the problem there is at least with a cannonball, you'll get some bounce and roll with it. So you'll take out a long path of uh-huh. droids or enemy or whatever. But then with these discs, they would just hit and they would probably slide a couple, a little bit more. Yeah, it's hard to tell, like, how big these things are, and I don't necessarily Mm -hmm. remember if they're explosive or not. Like, that definitely didn't stick in my head, whether or not they're, like, bombs or just heavy projectiles. Yeah, I don't remember either. Um, But for sure we see them later on, and I don't remember explosions either. The one time I remember one making contact is it hits a ship, but then the ship explodes. I don't know if that's because of the cannon disc thing or right something else Hmm. but um yeah well i'll look in that later but anyways what else is happening we have uh the we have authorization authorization to to drop this electro proton bomb uh Mm -hmm. so any calls on the bombers the bombers head out uh there's you know Little montage fight scenes in between as the bombers approach. The bomb is dropped. There is a kind of dumb droid gag here where some of the droids, like, you know, they, like, look up and they're like, oh, shit. And several of them panic and run away. And one of them just kind of stands there stupidly. And I can imagine it, like, just smashing him straight in the forehead. Just staring at it. And yeah. then we have this really, really, really awesome, like, series. Like, it's not just an explosion. It's not just, like, a shock wave. It's not just, like, electricity that shoots out. But we have, like, this multi-level of what happens when this bomb hits. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And it starts with kind of a traditional boom explosion you can imagine a crater shockwave smoke going out and Mm -hmm. then once this reaches i guess so far out then there's kind of like that silence before uh like the sonic chargers that jango fett drops out Mm -hmm. on obi-wan and then there's then you see this large ball of energy that is pulsing outward and growing in tone as it expands outward past the initial shockwave in the smoke. And it is, uh, it bursts, destroys droids with like a concussive force and then an electrical force after that. And Mm -hmm. I thought that this was really, really well done. And it definitely displayed the destructive forces of this bomb. Yeah. I like that. This was, visually done rather than through a lot of explanation as this show can do at times. Um, I did find it interesting that there was a physical explosion to a certain radius first before the EMP Mm -hmm. uh, kind of blasts out. And then I did find it interesting that being an EMP, it was, it was, it it was still total. So it affected not only the droids, but Republic, tanks and ships and even anakin's arm so i totally called that Mm -hmm. to myself like uh you see it coming and expanding outward and outward and i was like oh shit like what about you know what about the attts and then you see the legs like fall underneath them like they lost power or something they're dropping and like shit is losing power and then uh cuts back to like an interior scene of 
uh, the five stockholders of of this bomb project watching out. And I went, well, fuck, I wonder if that's going to do something to Anakin's arm, too. And Mm -hmm. Anakin says something like, oh, here it comes. And then you see the blue wave, like, pass, pass over them. And he kind of winces, right? And then you see him looking down at his looking down at his arm and there's like the blue lightning around it and yeah. you can tell that he definitely felt something like I don't know if it shut it down completely for a second and before he was able to regain control or what but uh there was something something yeah, happened like there. definitely something affected it but it's fairly quickly like a couple seconds later you see him reusing his hand right um so it didn't it didn't linger for long, but I, I still appreciated that detail for sure. I did as well. Question: mm-hmm. Are these droids dead? Like, does this does this qualify for we just killed some droids? Like, mark them down. Yeah, mark I them think down these on droids the are dead. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we're gonna take a little we're gonna take a little break from uh, pushing the plot forward here because, uh, as you well know. I have a list <laughs> of our on-screen death, right? Uh-huh. So, yep. before this, our score was droids 3,120 points to clones 738 points. Mm-hmm. Now, as... I do. I figured out how many droids we see die on screen. And uh-huh. you might be thinking, Kevin, you're fucking crazy. Like, how did you count all of those things? But luckily, we have a couple of nice pan over shots. So we can see that this grid of droids is all broke down in the same fashion. And mm-hmm. there are, uh, we see earlier, like a section of droids. And it's 10 by 15 battle droids. Mm-hmm. Behind that is 10 by 15 super battle droids. Okay. And they are arranged in a cluster of eight. So then later we see that of these clusters of eight, they are three wide and four deep. Sorry, four wide and three deep. So this works out to 28,800 droids that just got wiped out. So our new score. <laughs> is clones 29,539 to by the end of this episode the droids have 3,127 so we see 7 clone troopers die in this episode but 28,800 droids so Damn. I know that last week I was uh, expressing some concern that I didn't know if the if the clones were going to be able to pull this one off and consider it a victory in the end. Mm. And uh, then we get this. So yeah, the odds are in the, (laughs) the the good guy's favor currently. Oh boy. Yeah. So I don't know how it's going to shake out down the line. And uh, this could be, this could be (laughs) the, the turning point for sure. So there you have it. That's all yeah, I got. Yeah. You need anything else this episode? I mean, we got 28,800 nope. droids down for the count. Not on that note. So what? what's happening next? Let's, that, that's it, <laughs> man. That's all I got. That's it. <laughs> Show over. Um, no, nah, what happens next is uh, the, Dugs, the Dugs are all happy. They cheer. Uh, Anakin's like, hey, Doc, looks like your shit worked. Uh, congratulations on building a bomb that can kill 28,800 droids in about five seconds. And then uh, we see some movement outside the window and a large sinkhole opens up underneath where this bomb hit. And uh, I think Mace Windu accurately points out, hey, look, a sinkhole opened up underneath where the bomb hit. Or something. Yeah, there's that. There's that explanation I was waiting for. (laughs) Yeah. There's that. What can you do? Yeah. Um. So the the sinkhole opens up and it, it swallows up everything. Like so, the tanks, troopers go with it. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and it, it radiates out, but a lot of the troopers do start running soon enough to be outside the, the sinkhole. Um, all right. Yep. So we've got a yeah. debriefing at this point with Mace, Anakin, Bull, Doge, Sheev, R2. My note is, how is this shit working? Because we see all this stuff get struck, and Sheev is actually in hollow form uh, when the bomb goes off, and he says something to the effect of, I'm losing your transmission, and then like he disappears. So yep. it's definitely devastating to droids, and it affects other technology as well but it seems like you can kind of reboot that and uh bring it back up pretty quickly because r r2 didn't die he was in the no. blast radius unless he wasn't for some reason i wonder if i wonder if knowing that's coming they have a way to kind of shield or you know just kind of it's like preemptively they, like they put a lead blanket over him like he was at the dentist yeah. or something Lead blanket, or there's some sort of like surge protector mode for all of this stuff, you know? Like, yeah, that very well could be. Uh, yeah, and then like Anakin kind of forgets, he's like, oh shit, my arm, mm-hmm. right? Because, like I said, his arm comes back within seconds. See, I kind of chalked that up to uh, it working off of his electrical impulse nervous system. Uh, mm-hmm. so. It's like it stopped working until his brain was able to retake control of it, hmm. which, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, because I don't know how his arm works at all, so I don't there's either. some connection, but yeah, as to what's powering it, I don't know. Yeah, and I don't know if there's like a quick disconnect where you could just like remove it and put something else on real quick yeah. like, or, or how it works if it's like built into his built into you know his bloody stump or or what but yeah like uh, i don't i don't know if it's like connected to like open tissue or anything like there might be i would imagine there's few, there's definitely got to be some sort of uh there's like pins and stuff maybe but not like there's not an open wound of a stump still on the other end of robotics does that make sense yeah i'm thinking that on uh there's there's like a a mechanical organic interface at the end of his stump so instead mm-hmm. of it being like some weird fucking stump thing now it's like a weird computer port stump thing yes okay that makes sense that's my guess anyway i yeah. don't know uh but as to how it gets powered is another that's another question and that's do you think he has batteries anything. for it or i don't think so or because like it's got like, like s- uh, it's got like something that moves around in it, so it like charges through kinetic movement. So every once Possibly. in a while, he's got to like do some some fist pumps in the air and like like it's like a shake weight or something to like recharge itself. Yeah, like so, possibly like a Faraday battery, something. Yeah, because we see. We see we see at the end of Attack of the Clones the exposed Robo hand, and we see yeah. Luke's Robo hand without the skin prosthetics on on top of it. Luke's looks way better, <laughs> but yeah, it I mean, doesn't. Anakin's I mean, looks way better in Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, but there's still no. It doesn't seem thick or anything, right? Like to have to house a battery that gets either recharged or replenished mm-hmm. or something. So it's got to be working off of like his electrical energy, I guess. I guess, but it doesn't seem like it'd be supplying that much. I don't know. You right. never know. I mean, oh. this yeah. is a, this is a world where, where we can kill, you know, 28,800 droids like that. <laughs> and the 30, 30- in the MP. Epi- yeah. yeah, the 32 episodes before this, it was like. Uh, a thousand? 800, yeah. I think is what it was. <laughs> so, you know, we got that working for us. Um, I do. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's still canon or not, but I know, at least in old canon, uh, Anakin was always fucking with it, like tinkering with it, and like doing upgrades to his arm 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so I guess make it bigger, better, stronger, faster. I don't really yeah, know. Yeah, because that makes sense because he's already a... Uh, like, he's mechanically minded. Right. Right. He's a he's mechanical tinkerer. He, yeah, he built C-3PO. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's playing with the pit droids. He came to Earth and changed his name to Tony Stark. That. Yeah. <laughs> I think but that happened. I, Might not have. <laughs> so. Anyways, yeah. So, moving past the arm. Yeah, Sheev is in love with treaties because he's basically like, ooh, great, you killed the droids. Like, we won. Did they sign the treaty? Did Did the Dugs sign the treaty? Like, anybody? Hey. Like no, nope. we and we then they're all standing around. The they're treaty? like, yeah, they're all standing there. Like, no, we haven't gotten to the treaty yet. And then fucking Doge is like, we have to go to the council, right? Like, where the fuck was this council? Council this whole whole fucking entire time? That's the whole reason we're fucking here. Like, why didn't you bring the council with you? Yeah, like, why are we talking to you? Right. That's yeah. why I didn't get is suddenly, like. There had to have been treaty negotiations, and surely the negotiation point was like, hey, if you can get the Separatists out of here, then we will sign the treaty. Mm -hmm. But then why isn't the council just already around, ready to sign a thing as soon as this happens, right? I think this is where the negotiations are supposed to happen, because uh, Sheev's like, we need that treaty signed so we can gain access to the fuel reserves here on Malastair. Without it, our armies will be vulnerable. And Doge is basically like, yeah, I'll try. Yeah. So, so. Uh, at that point, I think Mason and Annie are like, hey, we need a rescue. Oh, there is a rescue team that went into the hole to look for mm-hmm. some some troopers. For survivors, yeah. They disappeared. Yep. So then... Uh, Mace goes to look for the rescue team and then mm-hmm. sends Anakin to go with uh, Doge to help out with the treaty negotiations. Correct. And I have to say that we see, we cut to a lat at this point, and uh, Mace is, Mace is there, that's what he's going to take, right? But the lat has the door open, and then mm-hmm. all those little vertical windows totally mm-hmm. closed off like we finally see how this fucking works it's like a little i don't know you can close the windows so i'm totally cool with these <laughs> things you know being in high altitudes or you know even outer yeah, space there's some seal there is some, some sort seal. of seal happening uh, yeah because for a long time we just saw like holes in them and it didn't matter like they could still take them anywhere and they still yeah. seem to pressurize and whatnot but uh there's definitely some sort of window closing device. <laughs> yep, that makes sense. I got to see with my own eyeballs, and yep. so I am happy with the lats again. <laughs> Doge so is Doge Mace, is concerned. Uh, go Sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna jump to Mace jumping down into the hole, right? Yeah, right before that, I was just going to say that Doge is concerned that uh, the bomb didn't upset the delicate balance of his planet, which is a real weird thing to bring up after the fact. Like, you knew it was going to happen, so yeah, why didn't you bring up your concern, I don't know, before you fucking <laughs> fired off this gigantic electro-nuclear weapon? Like, But also, like, their whole thing on this planet is that they're harvesting fuel like that's not gonna fuck shit up and they're harvesting it out of the core which sounds yeah. like that's even worse than like that sounds fucking extreme to me right but no one one electro proton bomb and y'all fuck shit up apparently <laughs> y'all better make sure you didn't fuck up my planet <laughs> You know, never mind that these people are trying to help you from not having your country or your uh, planet be entirely war torn. But sure, yeah. So, also, what happens before Mace ends up in the in the hole? Anakin is basically like, "Hey, Doge, like, what do we need to do to get this treaty signed?" Because uh, I guess Doge goes Doge goes to meet with the council, 
and he shows up and he's like, yo, I don't have a lot of time. Like, what, what are we going to do? And Doge is like, oh, we're still waiting on like two more members. Like, we'll sign it, but we just got to wait till they get here. Like, it's just fucking yeah. formality. This, <laughs> <laughs> it's bizarre. I'll just put it that way. Like, and what's kind of weird is like they're just kind of standing outside, if I remember correctly, right? They are. They're like, they're just standing in like a dirt pile. Like, they're not anywhere formal, it seems. No. They left the Imperial Palace. It's they so there's kind of like these camps set up, and I guess that's all the all the dugs. That's where they're staying, like in between battles, because this this war on this planet has gone on for fucking so long. They're able to take like I don't know, sleep breaks or nap breaks or something. Mm-hmm. You know, they have who knows. Uh but there's a, a shit ton of tents all over the place, and. And they are just kind of like hanging out. They're somewhere near the tents slash maybe near the sinkhole. I don't really know. Yeah. So their meeting place doesn't really make sense. Like this council doesn't really make sense. Uh, Why we have to have another treaty, I don't know. Maybe that was (laughs) a good old GL like, oh, hey, like this is really good. But I think that you should probably explain to people that they need to sign a treaty. And that's why... That's why uh that's why Sheev is is sad because otherwise they could just take the fuel but they should do it legally. Yeah, nope. Space C-SPAN is what we're getting. I guess, man. I don't know. <laughs> so at this point we cut to Mace and some survivors and Mace is like what the fuck happened and this trooper's like something's down here. Uh, mm-hmm. foreboding, you know, episode tile Title, The Zillow Beast. Uh, Mace calls more troopers. Oh, he grabs like three troopers. He's like, Trapper, Pons, Hawkeye, follow me. You're with me. Mm -hmm. Then Mace calls Anakin. He's like, hey, there's something strange. Oh, what, all right? There's something strange in the neighborhood. Mace is going to call Skywalker. That's what he's going (laughs) to do. Uh, But... He's like Anakin. Something, something funky's going on down here. You should probably take a look at it, because that's what you do. Yeah. Like I don't know what's going on. Let's put you in danger too. Come on. Let's go. Yeah. Come on down. Anakin's like I'm on it. I don't want to deal with these dugs and their stupid treaty yeah. and their council. Like I wasn't allowed to be on the council. I don't want to deal with this council. Yeah, because he can't do anything. He's fairly useless here, other than just walking behind doge they're just so. waiting for two other people to show up and doge yeah. is like no we're gonna sign it we just gotta wait for these guys yeah so again i don't know what the help was needed for if like, they're already like yeah we're i mean what no we're we're signing it you guys held up your part you guys got rid of the separatists their so. uber would have been here already but you set off a fucking emp that destroyed everything electrical on the planet so yeah, yeah it's gonna and take a little bit up a Massive sinkhole, so now we gotta go around the sinkhole. And if you didn't notice, we walk on our hands. It takes a little bit. Yeah, it's a little rough. So anyways, uh, so Mace and Troops are walking around, right? Yep. Trying to investigate what the what's down there with them. Yep, and Mace has a bad feeling about this. Indeed he does. We now get the unearthing of the Zillow Beast itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, my and it's uh, while Mace and troops are walking on it, the ground starts moving from underneath them. Because it's not the ground. It's the Zillow Beast. It's the Zillow Beast itself. I have a question. Which I thought was kind of cool. Yeah, go ahead. What the fuck beat up the troopers? Like, this trooper's like, there's something down here, man. It's scary, man. Like, we need some fucking help, man. Uh, I was trying to figure that out, too, because the action scene that follows right here... The Zillow Beast is massive, so, like, one paw will totally stomp down three troopers, right? Easily. But then we kind of get, like, a shot where when Mace is investigating, he sees a rock that has, like, handprints and, like, claw marks on it. See, I thought that that was uh, the troopers, like, trying to... To jump out of there? Yeah, I was thinking like that too, they're but they're like, like scrambling at the wall. I'm pantomiming yeah. doing this thing that uh, is what I will describe as pantomiming. Or no, wait, clawing at the wall. Yeah, I don't know. It's like Scooby Doo and Shaggy like trying to run up a wall. 
but they're clone troopers, and this is the aftermath, is what May sees. Uh, that makes sense. It's just like some of the hand marks were just in a weird direction that I don't know why anybody would be like scratching that way. Because it's like somebody grabbed them and they were pulling them back. Oh, and they go sideways. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that but makes I, sense. So that's why I'm like, well, who? What's what? Who's fighting? What's going on? Uh, and I, also, how the Zillow Beast is massive. So, what is happening that's like freaking them out? That like the rescue team goes missing, but nobody notices the beast down there, right? Right, because the, well, because the beast is still underground. Like only yeah, but parts then, of it are exposed at this point. But then, what's taking out? The, what took out the rescue team? That's my question, right? So I I agree. It's the 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 chain of events is a little odd. Do you think there are like Zillow beastlets, like little tiny I don't, ones? I don't think so. I think the only thing is, you know, maybe the Zillow beast moved around a little bit, took out the rescue team, but like it didn't disturb anything else around it. Like it kind of just shifted around, right? Yeah. So do you think but like then, rocks and shit were falling and these clone troopers have been like at this shit for days and are sleep deprived and uh, didn't know what the fuck was going on. So they're like scrambling to try to get out because like weird shit's happening, even though like nobody's down there. It's just them. I don't know. Cause like it a haunted seems house fairly, type of deal. It seems fairly quickly like it's the same day that the rescue team goes in. Right. It definitely seems like these events are sequential. Like. Meeting with like Sheev, this, yeah. bomb goes off, another meeting with Sheev, we move from point A to point B and C, Mace goes in the hole, Anakin finds out that two dudes need to fucking show up to sign the treaty, but like that's all said, everything's good. Uh, Anakin heads over to the sinkhole, boom, we're there. Like, it seems pretty, uh, like a quitty, like a... Like it's as close to real time as possible, sort of. Yeah, probably a little bit more than real time just because of, like, actual like tra- travel transit. time. Transit, yeah. Like, besides transit time. Mm-hmm. But it's 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 happening fairly in order. Like, I don't think there is any gaps. But again, yeah, the only thing I can think of is this thing is getting up, taking out a team very quickly, and it, it goes back to just digging itself into the rocks. And this is where Mace and company come upon it. Okay. I might... I might get down with that. Yeah. That's kind of the only thing I can imagine. How big do you think the Zillow Beast is? I was thinking in that, like, 50 to 60 foot range. It seemed big-ish, it, but not super, I don't know, like it, 100 maybe? 100 feet? Yeah. Because it's, things get weird, like... It looks different in size when it's just stomping on troopers. Mm-hmm. And then it looks different when uh, Anakin shows up with his starfighter and starts flying around it. Mm-hmm. It looks a little different then as well. So it is 97 meters. That's Jesus Christ. 318 feet. Yeah. Nope. Wouldn't have guessed that much. Which, if I mean, you're familiar with landmarks of St. Louis, which I don't know why you would be, I believe that the arch is like 620 feet tall, so roughly half the size of that. Okay. Or half the height. Um, it's fucking big. Yeah, for our roller coaster enthusiast, Millennium Force is 310 feet, I believe. So, yeah. Go with that. Yeah. Get that's, on, a, that's a tall roller coaster. <laughs> stand on top of that and jump as high as you can and. You're you're at Zillow Beast Heights. Yeah. Yeah, it just... It looks smaller. Because, like, the feet that stomp on the troops... Like, the paw itself is big, but then it doesn't look like there's a lot of mass behind it. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I think the hands and the feet on this thing have a kind of weird design. Uh, The whole Zillow Beast is kind of coated in, like, coated... uh, Coated is a terrible choice of words but uh it's got it's covered like, covered is probably a better choice of words <laughs> uh instead of scales it's got like these large armored plates and the whole thing looks segmented like uh mm-hmm. like a stereotypical parasitic tapeworm or something like that yeah and uh 
biologically, it's got, instead of, like, two limbs, it's got, like, three limbs each. So it's got, mm-hmm. like, three arms and three legs. Uh, which I like, question mark. Like, I think it's cool, but it makes the movement awkward a little bit sometimes. And I don't really know how this would work structurally as far as, like, a skeletal system goes. Uh, but then I was thinking that maybe maybe it doesn't have a skeletal system. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure about that one either because it definitely – it appears reptilian, mm-hmm. right? It stands up straight at some points, but there's – in its arms it, – like, it's still – its arms still have some sort of heavy structure, but it definitely... But they also have, like, a fluidity to them. Exactly, yes. So it, it was an interesting mix mm-hmm. um, that I'm I'm not quite sure about. So it could be, you know, it, like, each arm kind of moves the way, like, a snake slithers, right? Yep. That's kind of what I was thinking there. Um yeah, the, the, the three arms and three legs things is weird because anytime you move away from an even number of, you know, legs or arms or whatever have you, you know, things always get a little weird. Uh-huh. So it, it comes back to, like, the tripods from uh, H.G. Wells' uh, War of the Worlds, right? Right. We're like... You write it down, and it's really cool because you're like, oh, yeah, like, what could be more alien than a tripod, right, right coming from Mars? We don't have, right. instead of, like, a bifurcated system of mobility, it's, like, a three-way thing. and Yeah. it's But then... It's completely foreign well, because, I don't know. I've Everything s- here it works in even numbers when it comes to Typ- typically legs, yeah. But then, the, the, once you like see that visually, things get like all fucked up because like a tripod makes sense for something stationary where at least uh, every leg will find its way to the ground, right? But then the moment you pick one of those legs up, you lose balance, right? Right, which is like why it segways only have two wheels and not three. Yeah, you, like you can't shift to, uh, like w- when we walk, when we pick up one leg, our body weight shifts over the one leg. But then when you have two, it's like, and you're trying to have a forward momentum, things just get all fucked up. That's know? why I'm wondering if it's not like a typical like joint structure, like a... Uh, because what is what does the human body have? It has like it has fixed joints that don't move, mm-hmm. like in your skull, mm-hmm. and then there are like a ball and socket, like your hips and your shoulders that can move mm-hmm. in multiple directions, or like a hinged joint, more like your fingers or your elbows and your knees. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I think that this is potentially something different than that, and I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I just, it's it's an interesting character design. I um, agree. It's hard to extract. That said, I do like it. Do you want to hear some statistics of the Zilla Beast, other than the fact that it is three hundred and eighteen feet in length? Sure, run through it quickly. Its yeah. gender is male. Its allegiance is neutral. Its homeworld <laughs> is Malastare. Its weapons are bite, claws, and stomp. <laughs> its talents are described as size makes it a terrifying opponent. Known <laughs> companions are Dr. Bull and Chancellor Palpatine. All right. Interesting. So there you have it. Okay. <laughs> that is from the official Star Wars The Clone Wars character encyclopedia. Very nice. Um, that one to the side. Uh, let's move on from talking about the Zilla Beast to kind of talking about getting what back happens. in the story. Yeah. yeah. So Anakin flies down with his star, uh, starfighter. Uh, 
fairly he distracts it while Mace uh and other troopers escape. But then the Zilla Beast lands a hit on the Starfighter and Anakin crashes. R two D two is there as well and flies out of there himself and then uh Anakin is uh on the ground running up the uh up to the Zillow Beast. He tries to get, get a lightsaber strike on it, but it he finds out really quickly that the lightsaber is not able to penetrate the scales. Wait, doesn't uh R two doesn't fly out by himself, right? Doesn't Anakin ride R two? Is this now or no, is no, this no. Later? so he flies around out of the ship and then lands next to Anakin on the ground. Okay. Right. So then Anakin runs up to try and fight the thingy, and then he's like, get out of here, R2, and then R2 kind of flies away a little bit. Um, He's still in the general area, but then when Anakin finds out that he's not able to actually do anything with the lightsaber, uh, Anakin jumps on R2, and R2 is able to jet them out of the uh, sinkhole pit, I guess. Okay. So then he gets on top, uh, Anakin and Mace kind of have a quick conversation about what's down there, and uh, then Doge comes up and explains that it's a Zilla beast, and it's something the ancestors knew about, and it was once the dominant yeah, creature. we knew that they were here. Yeah, but then they, they thought they were all extinct because they, as soon as the, the Dugs came to the planet, uh, they fought off the uh, Zillow Beasts. They and, found a way to defeat them, right? Uh, cleared Malastare. Yes, yeah, they cleared Malastare of all the Zillow Beasts. Uh, even though early on, you know, it wasn't looking so great for the Dugs, but they eventually overcame. Uh, clearly, as Dugs are now the remaining creatures on uh, Malastare. Um, yeah, I think so, what his, his quote is something to the effect of, uh, once we harvested, started harvesting the fuel, we co- killed off the Zillow Beast. They were supposedly extinct, but apparently not. Yeah, this is this one left here. I do have um, a note so that then, says, I'm not really sure I see the connection between harvesting fuel and killing off the Zillow Beast, right? Yeah, they, they don't make it clear. I'm wondering if it's just like, I don't know, food source or something weird happened regarding that. Something the Zilla Beast needed. Um, yeah. It, or, or harvesting fuel gave Dugs like other technology to help them fight mm-hmm. off Zilla Beast, possibly. But it's it's definitely like a one liner that kind of just gets tossed in there. Yeah, it it comes up later and it's I won't even call it a payoff, but I mean it, it just kinda is what it is. Like he makes this weird verbal connection and just kind of breezes past it. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, after that, there he's like, hey, you know, this is this is what we're going to do. We're going to kill this thing. And then it, it shows these, these disc launchers, except for they're mm-hmm. on the edge of the sinkhole, and they're just, like, dropping them in. Just, like, yep. dropping them in, peppering the Zillow Beast with these things. And I think I thought this is what you were talking about earlier when you said we see these things again i don't remember if these things are exploding or not yeah at this point i really don't remember i this is what i was trying to think of earlier and i don't remember them exploding i think i think they do i think they do too but i don't remember or at least there's like some smoke or something yeah i could be i could be wrong uh the dugs are all chanting something Doge and Mace are arguing about whether or not they should kill the Zillow Beast. And Doge basically says, hey, it was your bomb. You need the fuel. Kill it, and I'll sign the treaty. Otherwise, like, you're not any better off than you were, and I'm going to fucking do it anyway. Yeah. And you're not going to have the benefit of the fuel that you need. So um, It's right around this point. I don't remember the exact moment, but Mace and Anakin are talking to each other about... Um, what to do with the Zilla Beast, and then they kind of walk in on the council looking at some ancient scroll, trying uh-huh. to find the weakness for the, the Zilla Beast. Yep. Um, which this I found is... interesting, because they're, they're trying to hide it from Anakin and Mace, but I'm not quite sure why, really. That's a good question. Their, I guess their I didn't goal make is a to try and kill it. That yeah. The scroll was like the prophecy... 
I guess they well, uh, yeah, they. But they, it totally makes sense. Like you were you working this out? Like this is what they're doing? Like they're they're looking into what they're supposed to be doing because presumably the Zillow Beast have been gone for so long. It's more of a legend mm-hmm. than something that uh, any living Doug had to deal with in their lifetime. So it's like they knew that they were killed off, but they didn't know how. Yes. So they're trying to kind of piece things back together. Uh, it's at this point that. Anakin and Mace have a conversation of whether or not they should kill the Zilla Beast, right? And yeah, because it's Doge's, the last of its Doge's kind. standpoint is essentially one more time. Well, yeah, because it's like Mace and Anakin are concerned that it's the last of uh, its kind, mm-hmm. so they don't want to exterminate what they perceive as an innocent creature. Uh, Doge kind of brings up the point that it attacked them, you know, it took out Anakin's starfighter, but they're like, yeah, that's because we attacked it. Like, we literally dropped a bomb on it. Yeah, so, so over then, the next several minutes of this episode, it's different groups of people talking about what they should do with the Zillow Beast. Yes. Uh, and there's always opposing views. You know, Doge's stance is the Scroll of Destiny tells us that we need to kill it. Mason and Anakin are like, no, it's the last of its kind, not gonna happen. And then we get, then we get Sheev, and we get, uh, I think we get Doctor Bolin on this also. Yes. And Bolin's yeah. like, no, we need to study it. And Sheev's like, nope, kill it, kill it, kill it, kill it, kill it. Like, all he's yeah, concerned do, about, do whatever yeah. we need to do to have them sign the treaty. Exactly. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at right now. And Doge is still like, nope, we're going to kill it. Like, that's what we're going to do. So there's, there's some and tanks. Then... Doge and Annie talk about killing the Zillow Beast. Uh, Doge says, open the valves, which I don't know who he's talking to, but we see these big pipes pumping this green shit into the, uh, into the sinkhole. And this. Yes through context clues I figured out was fuel and they were trying to, (laughs) they made some connection between the fuel and the Zillow beast. And I think that what Doge says is like they're the Zillow beast has like a weakness to the fuel or something. He explains that miles to air fuel kills the Zillow beast, which seems really odd to me. Uh, This thing presumably, or according to the encyclopedia is from Malastair. And then it evolved in an environment where the core of the planet is the one thing that can kill it. Well, I mean, the I, core stays in the core, right? Like, well, apparently not. In, not until the the dugs start digging in, right? You know. I mean, the core of planet Earth is iron, right? Yeah, but, but we, like, but there is iron that is present in other places other than the core. I guess, but the, like, so whatever is in this core is like, say, some sort of oil, right? Right, some green snot oil. Yeah, some like secret of the ooze, green yep. shit. So, like, this planet works a little bit differently, where it seems like you aren't supposed to really tap into this fuel source. Right. Like, we don't really see it. We know nothing about it, really, other than the fact that it's green. And they harvest it in some form. And it's fuel. And it's fuel. So, that's why I don't see a problem with this. Like, I I understand that, you know, like, think of it like if you jumped in a volcano, which is, like, core juice. Okay. Right? Like, that's bad. Right. Yeah, I guess I was thinking of it more along the lines of, uh, like the aliens from Signs and Water. Yes, like that I would understand, but again, water's on the surface, but molten lava is not always right. Okay, that's how it. That's how I feel about this fuel hurting the Zillow Beast. Um. Yeah. 
So, yeah, they start dumping this fuel in there. And the Zilla Beast does seem to get aggravated. Um, is it somewhere around this point um, where Anakin and May start trying to talk the dugs out of it? Because they're like, hey, if we keep aggravating it, it's just going to climb out of the pit. Uh-huh, and for then sure. Th- yep. Then we have to deal with it up here, which is even worse. My next so, note was Mace disagrees, they argue. Uh, there's more disagreement, there's more disc bomb attacks. Uh, at this point... Here's what point, I don't get about this point, though. Okay. So, the Dugs and Doge himself tell the Jedi that they won't sign the treaty unless the Jedi and the Republic help kill the Zillow Beast. And then as soon as... Um, actually, no, maybe this point comes later. But but Doge then kind of tells Jedi, the Jedi that they're like, no, we're going to do this. This is how we're going to do it. Leave us alone. Yeah, that's totally what just, happens. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> well, because at this point, Mace is pissed and he's like, no, fucking stop. And Doge is like, what do you mean yeah. stop? And he's like, no, I'm telling you to stop. And he runs his little mace ass over there with his purple lightsaber and like threatens doge with it like he's gonna cut him down which isn't gonna mace this isn't gonna solve anything you're just gonna kill one guy and then you're gonna have fucking everybody against you like great even doge brings it up is like what are you gonna do like you're a jedi like you want to protect an innocent creature but you're threatening to kill us like that doesn't make any sense he kind of calls him out which i did like um, but then, uh, Anakin and Mace kind of have their own aside, uh, with, I think Dr. Bull and, so, is uh, there? almost what happens next is that, uh, so Mace threatens Doge and then there's more of this gas attack right and the Zillow Beast is fucking pissed because they keep throwing these disc bomb things at them and then the Zillow Beast kind of starts to look like sleepy Mm -hmm. and I don't remember if he like falls down or passes out or something and Anakin's like hey it worked Mace is like are you sure and he's like yeah I'm sure you go no you're jumping forward you're jumping forward a little bit really so because we, we skipped over something. So, like, first of all, the Zilla Beast goes on, like, climbs out the fucking hole uh-huh. and then gets on a fucking rampage. Uh-huh. We skipped over the rampage, right? Okay. So, he goes on a giant fucking rampage. Um, but then, even before that, um, Anakin suggests that they stun the Zilla Beast between the scales to yeah. put it to sleep. Yep, you're right. He suggests right. that they pretend to kill it and then yes the and the then they dumb, take it away the dumb dugs aren't going to notice the difference exactly and they'll just remove the body before the dugs realize that they didn't actually kill it and they'll Completely. just reloc- relocate the thing yeah so they take these tanks that have stunners on them um and then uh th- yeah so this is when i think uh they roll in with the tanks and they're like hey we'll help you guys out and then the dugs are like no fuck you like th- we're gonna do it our way yep you're so right so you ask for help you and then they don't want it so they keep pissing off the thing the thing crawls out of the uh sinkhole yeah goes on a fucking rampage uh this is when it becomes really clear that this is one big giant japanese kaiju homage to godzilla and the like this is the homage that I was talking about last week when I said, yep. hey, we're moving from one story that was ripped off from something to another story that was ripped off from something. Indeed. So, yeah, Rampage picks it up, picks up tanks, starts crushing them, crushes two tanks together. Okay, I, we need to talk about that. Uh-huh. What? Is this good? Like, I'm, I'm going to admit I've never actually seen a full Godzilla movie in any oh, form. I'm... Yeah. Right? I am well familiar with the cultural Godzilla, but not familiar with the individualized storytelling of Godzilla. 
if that makes sense. Um, so in terms, it, look, the last episode was really trying to hard to take story cues from Seven Samurai, right? Uh-huh. And then that's the thing that bothered me, right? Like it took story elements, but didn't see it all the way through so then like motivations get muddled and reasoning gets muddled and that creates its own problems when it comes to just homaging godzilla like story points aren't the important part right i was thinking more specifically about the zillow beast getting pissed and picking up a couple of tanks and like smashing them together and then fucking throwing them it's not unprecedented, okay. right? So, the Godzilla series, like any series that has gone on for some uh, 50 some years, 54 years, I think they're on now. Um, uh, you know, it's it's had its highs and it's definitely had its lows and then it's had its highs again and mm-hmm. it's had its lows again. Right. Um, and you, you know i'm not i'm not surprised that some people don't understand godzilla's powers or whatever so like when the gareth edwards 2014 version came out mm-hmm. um and so you haven't even the... seen that one no i have no okay i think well, maybe he... okay so maybe i saw a part of it but uh, by saying yeah. that i may have seen less than a third of it, probably. Yeah, the one with Brian Cranston, you know. Um, Ooh, that doesn't and, sound familiar. Uh, I don't think I've seen anything, any of that. Yeah, I, I am more familiar with reading about Godzilla movies <laughs> than actually having seen Godzilla movies. Yeah, whereas I have seen not all of them, but definitely most of them. Like some of them hard. The the thing is, there are so many, and they are hard to find because not all of them have been. You know, e- they're not easily accessible on home video in the United States. Right. Um, so there there are a lot of, like, I would love to sit down and do, like, a mega viewing. Um, but Godzilla is an interesting series where, um, where, where James Bond was one continuity up until Casino Royale. So Casino Royale resets everything. Uh, We're going to have to talk about that later so you can explain that to me. Oh yeah, I still I uh, um random side note just to let people know where I stand. I'm a huge James Bond fan, but I fucking hate Casino Royale for doing that. Um okay, random question to you. Yes. Do you like the movie The Rock? I have not seen that in long so long that I don't want to make a judgment on it, but I have heard the theory that uh, that is James Bond in retirement doing his own thing. Like I've heard people try and make that a uh like a proxy Bond film. Yes, and I believe that only works if you also go along with the theory that James Bond is a title, not a specific not a person. person. And which is why uh his face changes sometimes yes. between movies because there's a different literal person taking actors. up the mantle yeah. of James Bond in the James yes. Bond universe. Yeah, Casino Royale gives some evidence to this, but then every other Bond movie fights that idea. So we're going to go off topic really quickly here, but in Die Another Day, uh, the only person that they definitely kill off, and it is when the actor leaves, that person is gone, is Q. So Q is known to be a title, but then... Because the actor really did stay for like 30 some years of Bond films, uh, they had a movie where he literally retires. And then the next movie they have uh, who was called R, but then he, when Q retires, he gets the title of Q. He takes James Bond down into the archives, Mm -hmm. and James Bond himself remarks that he hasn't seen a lot of this stuff in a long time, but that he remembers them. So couldn't that be explained away uh, as though this current James Bond was in the... They're what? MI6, right? Yes. 
could this current James Bond not have been a part of MI6, but was reassigned to a different site? Like, couldn't he have been around no, the ship but not? He brings up specific memories, such as being married. So, I'm there, gonna, there are. I'm, I'm going to head cannon all of this shit. See what happened is there's like a fucking chip they put in their head. <laughs> See, so that's that... what I'm saying. Like, there are allusions to Pierce Brosnan, like Pierce Brosnan's Bond brings it up where he's like, he brings up allusions to have been, been ma- being married once, which is a thing that happens in On Her Majesty's Secret Service with, with George Lazenby. Okay. The only thing that helps the other theory is when in Lazenby's pre-credit sequence in the, the cold open for On Her Majesty's Secret Service, um, there is a gag where he defeats all the different henchmen. It's the only breaking of the fourth wall in the entire James Bond franchise. Lazenby takes a look at the camera and goes, this never happened to the other guy. Da-da, da-da. And then opening credit sequence. Um, that's the only thing that would kind of lend some credence to that, but it's never brought up again. And then... Again, Die Another Day kind of connects everything back together uh, where he he holds on to these memories. Um, so that's, that's the thing that bothers me about Casino Royale is that it throws away some 40 years of character history that I wish it didn't. Um, also because if you... Casino Royale is the only James Bond book I have read. And it's the first James Bond book that Ian Fleming published. It's not James Bond's first mission. So there's no need to show him becoming a double O. There's no need to do any of that. They really could have told mostly the same story, dropped the detail that this is his first mission, and played out the rest and saved that continuity. Right? I think what they meant was like it's his first mission in this movie. <laughs> no, he gets his double O right at the beginning of the movie. So, <laughs> so what you're because the opening me... scene, yeah, the opening scene is him killing a guy, which is his second kill because that is how you earn your double O status. Yeah, your double O status. Okay, see, here's here's my other problem. It throws away so much fucking history. So again, we lose. It's it's like when Disney throw threw away the eu except it's actual like if disney threw away episodes one through three kept four through six and then made up their own shit afterwards right um because we know that the double the reason james bond can kill people and not face legal repercussions is because the double o gives you a license to kill so it's you shit be like a that. double l why because there's two what? L's at the end of kill. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. I always just found it interesting that because of the way double O's work, like you would theoretically only have nine double O's running around. Like you can't have double O ten, I guess, right? You can. I mean, it's, it's it just you sounds weird. You can have double O twenty eight thousand eight hundred droids that died in this episode. I guess. Oh, anyways, this was a long way of getting around to Godzilla. Uh, every movie accepts 1964 Godzilla as canon, except for the newest one. The newest one is a pure reboot. The now, Gareth Edwards one? No. Gareth Edwards is its own timeline, separate of whatever, right? So, does not exist in Japanese timeline, Godzilla's. Okay. So... um but does seem to take 1964 Godzilla as canon uh, because um, Ken Watanabe's character brings it up, experiment 1964, blah, 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 happen, something happened in Japan. Brings up the exact year. Um, now, that that's its own timeline. That's its own franchise, right? So it's like so, Brian Singer's Superman. Yes, sort of. Um, yeah, that's a pretty good good example, you know. So then the newest Godzilla that came out in 2016, um, Shin Godzilla. Sounds right. 
Yeah, Shin Godzilla is the the latest of the, like so the official Godzillas that are canon are the Toho Godzillas, right? So they have rebooted on occasion. Uh, so like I, I forget the exact years, but it goes like from 1964 into the 80s, and then they had got so far that a, one of the movies said, "Hey, you know what?" This movie is going to ignore that we had the last handful of movies, but we will use this as a sequel to 1964, right? So then that happens sometimes in the sometime in the 80s. So like Superman Returns ignores Superman's three and four, this is a sequel to Superman two, right? Happens again sometime in the 90s, I believe, and then happens again in the I th- think right after Godzilla. 2000 i could be wrong but it, it's been rebooted a couple of times like soft reboots right so they always accepted mm-hmm. 1964 godzilla as full canon and then use that as a launching pad it's not until shin godzilla that they ignore that whole thing so the attack that happens in shin godzilla is the first time any of these people in this movie have seen godzilla whereas even in the other reboots you know it's like a holy shit it's been 20 years but he's finally back Hmm. Yeah. Um, is there room in the timeline for Tommy Oliver's Green Ranger Dragon Zord that looked like Godzilla? Uh, that's that's a thing that comes up in some of the other timelines because you have Mecha Godzilla, Mecha Ghidorah. Okay. Those things happen so, potentially. And so this is why soft reboots happen because, like, number one, either Godzilla got too powerful or the the villains got too f- weird. There's literally one movie, and I cannot remember which one, where... So Godzilla in the... Uh, when Gareth Edwards' 2014 Godzilla came out, uh, spoiler alert, he uses his atomic breath. And I just about lost my fucking head when that happened, because... Uh, lost your head ni- good or lost your head bad? Good, good. Because the, the 1998... American version like ignored any powers that Godzilla actually had. Is that the one with Inspector Gadget? Yep, indeed it is. And okay. uh Apu. Um hmm. <laughs> Hank Azaria. Uh so his atomic breath shows up in twenty fourteen and it's a like really awesome moment uh where God like Godzilla is the good guy in this one sort of thing. Um like he's respect like, he's a creature to be respected. Um a lot of the people that I, I saw it with or heard from didn't realize that that was a thing Godzilla could do, which is really fucking weird because it's a thing that happens in the first Godzilla movie, 1964. You're talking he, about like breathing fire, right? For yeah, the, essentially. To, to yeah. the layperson. Yeah, yeah. He's breathing yeah. fire, destroying Tokyo, leveling it to the ground, right? Right. Um, there is one movie where... Godzilla needs to get off Monster Island because that's where all the monsters live is Monster Island together, right? So when Godzilla is done tearing up Tokyo, he goes back home to uh, Monster Island, which is where his son also exists. Um, there's <laughs> he, he needs to get off Monster Island, so he uses his atomic breath, leans over, blows his atomic breath to the ground... And then he lifts off, and there is a puppet where his tail is curled under him. He's his arms are tucked in, and he's using his atomic breath for propulsion, and is flying off Monster Island. Hmm. That's that's an ability that Godzilla did have at some point. Interesting. Um, so, anyways, that's a long way of just kind of uh, describing how timelines work regarding story for Godzilla. But the fact is Godzilla, uh, I, back to your question. Yeah. Godzilla picking up cars is not a thing. He really does stomping on cars. His but, tail, he but has, he could, he, he could, it's not against the rules. Like his, his major power other than Tom breath is going to be maybe uh his, his tail whip, which his is, tail is fairly powerful. Anakin's, Fighter went down. Uh, fighter goes down. Yes. So there's definitely a direct homage there. Okay. Um. So, 
and uh, the the imagery of the stun lasers being shot off the tanks towards Godzilla or uh, towards uh, the Zillow Beast uh-huh. is definitely that's a direct homage as well to things that have happened towards Godzilla. You know, shooting a lot of tanks at it, stuff like that. Well, I um, think the name Zillow Beast, like Godzilla Beast, were yes. I mean, there you have yeah. it. Right. Yeah. So that that's fairly direct. Um, it's interesting to me that they didn't go the other way because really in Godzilla was a name they made up for Americans. It's not actually his real name in uh, Japanese. In Japanese, it's Gojira. So sometimes you'll hear mm. uh, the 1964 film referred to as Gojira um, just to kind of keep sanity versus comparing it with, you know, 1998 Godzilla, 2014 Godzilla, anything right. else Godzilla, right? Um, so there, there's a Gojira is uh, another thing about Gojira that's interesting. It's a uh, I forgot what the word is, but it's when you take two words and make a new word with it. You contraction. Know. No, not even that. No, not even a contraction. You're that's that is true. You're you're correct. No, I'm um, I'm over simplifying things. But uh, I forgot what the fuck the term is. But like, because they took Go from Gorilla and then Jiro, which is like the second half of like Whale or something like that, and then just made up their own new word with it. And then they just called this thing Gojira. And then when they translated <laughs> it to English, you know, somebody took it and figured out that Godzilla was close enough, but it also sounded more powerful for the American English speaking ear. Because it has the word um, God in it. Basically, yeah. Um, so it, it showed off the, the power of Godzilla. Uh, but, but like my question or like my, my feeling with, uh, the Zillow beast earlier, Godzilla's height throughout films has never remained consistent whatsoever, which has always been interesting as well. So, yeah, I thought I had read that, that, uh, like Gareth Edwards Godzilla was the biggest Godzilla or second biggest Godzilla or something. Oh yeah. Yeah. By far. Um, and I think it starts in the first film, he starts out at like 50, 60 feet. Like he's just barely above some of the skyscrapers. Uh-huh. And then um, some of the reboots do size them back down. Right. But then um, I want to say like, I remember Godzilla 2000 was like the one I watched a lot for some weird reason like that. It, it wasn't the greatest. It just, for whatever reason, like it was the one that was like pre heavy CGI that, got like the best puppetry and the best miniatures in it. Uh-huh. But that one, they made him like 300 feet in that one, I think, you know, huh. and he's just like stepping over skyscrapers, you know, or like knocking them down. So he's his, his tail whip, you know? So he's about the size of the Zillow beast. The Zillow beast. He, he gotcha. gets there. Yeah. Gareth Edwards, I think goes to like 350 or something fucking nuts like that. So, right. But he's also like the chunkiest one for sure. Uh, I remember that that was also my complaint with Gareth Edwards Godzilla. I think it was a fine design. It just I wish it had a neck. <laughs> it's just no. missing a neck. It's just weird. It, I don't I need I need like a fully hunched over head with a snout sort of situation. Um, but the the last uh, note on Godzilla I will give for people who uh, as we go through this history lesson of Godzilla um it's not fully intentional and it doesn't always work, but an interesting thing about Godzilla cultural from a cultural standpoint is if you go through the years of Godzilla, he starts out as a villain, right? He tears up Tokyo. It's this great demon and it's clearly a Hiroshima and Nagasaki analogy, right? So, Right, you know the the Americans came in, created this beast, dropped the bombs, and this is a monster that they have to live with, you know, mm-hmm. uh, after the fact. Um, it's because Wolverine I been saying, wasn't there to protect Godzilla, right. Before he was, have I been saying sixty four? I meant fifty four, by the way. Yeah, so nineteen fifty four, right. not sixty four. I keep saying sixty four. Um, uh, so then Godzilla for a few movies is the villain, but then. The United States and Japan start getting chummy, and we start becoming friends. And you know, like leading up to the '80s, you know, they they uh, Japan starts becoming like a technological powerhouse, and we depend on Japan to 
invent some of the best electronics. Nintendo. Nintendo. uh, All things Sony, Canon, Nikon. um, Also Nintendo. And Nintendo. Um, So Godzilla starts becoming a savior. There are other monsters that come to Japan. Rodan, Mothra. um, Which is the idea of Monster Island, right? Right. Right. So these other creatures start to come, and Godzilla's a good guy. And then every now and then, we will do something to piss off Japan, and then you will see that Godzilla's a fucking bad guy, right? Huh. So it, it doesn't always work out that way, but it, if you pay close attention, there is an evolution to Godzilla that you can pay it, you can see through that lens. Um, we will have to see if the same thing happens with our beloved Zillow Beast. Uh, but in, I'm going to pull you episodes. back in because yes. you were talking about the lasers shooting the yep. Zillow Beast and how it had so, something to do with Godzilla or or not. It's it's a it's an imagery that exists in in Godzilla like shooting lasers back at it. Okay. Um like I said, Godzilla gets to the point where um oh, fuck, what the fuck is it called? The the last Godzilla movie before Shin Godzilla uh in 2004 for the 50th anniversary, um they created a mega 50th anniversary uh Godzilla movie that was going to retire Godzilla for at least a decade. Toho made this <laughs> promise. This was going to be the last Godzilla movie, not ever, but at least for a decade. And they did hold up to that promise because if you count Gareth Edwards's film, 2014, that's 10 years exactly down the line. 2016 really is when that gap closes. They had a 12-year gap between movies. Um, but uh, shit, what is it called? Because it's, it's an awful fucking movie. Uh, but it's a Godzilla movie that takes place in the sort of future where they're, as you were asking about uh, Tommy's dinosaur, um, there are like these space rangers that Buzz Lightyear? Have been, basically, yeah. <laughs> these like Japanese space force people who. Uh, these aliens come down and they start releasing all the fucking monsters. So it's literally scene after scene of every Godzilla villain. Like there is no story. It's just a montage of like, here's Rodan. And then like a space ranger comes in, has like laser hand things. There's one that's like game over buddy. And like shoots it in the fucking top of the head and it goes down. I'm pretty uh, sure this is a storyline that happened in the Power Rangers. Oh, I'm 100% sure. Uh, there's even one scene where um, for about 20 seconds, they call it Zilla. They officially name it Zilla. It's the character design from the 1998 shitty Godzilla movie, the American one. Zilla jumps on Godzilla for two seconds Godzilla tail whips it into a building and Zilla dies. And that's all you ever see of fucking Zilla. But it canonized Zilla for a hot second. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyways, so like there are lasers, there's UFOs that show up, aliens, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, the imagery of like lasers showing up in the Godzilla universe isn't foreign per se, right? Um, uh, definitely the imagery of tanks surrounding kaiju of some sort for sure um, is is an imagery that shows up very often shin godzilla does this very well if if you have not if you're a, uh, a monster movie fan the i even for you i would recommend starting with the new one it like i said it's a complete reboot does not depend on any knowledge of any prior godzilla films in fact the more you know about G- the old godzilla films it, the more it kind of fucks with your expectations which i really appreciated um and the reason I'm okay with Shin Godzilla but not okay with Casino Royale is because Casino Royale didn't do anything that required a reboot. Shin Godzilla, the story it tells, I think, does very well by erasing everything. Um, I like how you looped it back to James Bond. Oh, because I will shit on Casino Royale every fucking chance I have. Um, I do gonna... not like that movie. But yeah, let's... 
close I'm, out this episode. I'm going to loop really it back close. to the Clone yeah. Wars because yeah, we're really we're fucking right close, fucking so. there. Uh, yeah. We got tanks with lasers yes. shooting Space Godzilla. And uh seems to be working. They do have to do some like shimmy backward shit, even though like some of their tanks got picked up and smashed and in yeah. a Hulk like fashion. Uh so from there we come back to the point that I was talking about earlier where Zillow Beast gets gets sleepy and uh lays down, takes a nap. Right? Basically, yep. And Just this is where the, the Anakin Mace conversation comes in with Anakin's finality of, yeah, I'm totally sure it worked, but you go first. Yes. Uh, so Which I did like. Mace that was a well-placed says, joke. I think it, it worked well. It really yes. did. Uh, Mace says, now we just have to get him out of here. The Zillow Beast eyes are closed fully. Mace. Mm-hmm. Does this weird thing where he like reaches out and like strokes his face, the face <laughs> of the Zill Beast, which I thought was odd. He cares for creatures, innocent creatures. I saw him in that movie with the snakes on the planes, and he did not give a shit. Hey, those snakes were. were As a those snakes fact, were not innocent, though. Those snakes were not innocent. He did not give a motherfucking shit about the motherfucking snakes on the motherfucking plane. He That's did all not. I'm saying. No. Nope. In fact, he was sick and tired of them. He was sick and tired of them. <laughs> uh, we cut to a boardroom. Yes. Anakin has Doge sign a data pad. Sheev welcomes him to the Republic, whatever that means. Uh, yep. Mace says the Zillow Beast is loaded. Where are we going? I think he suggests taking him to like the Outer Rim or something, letting him live in peace, which yes. sounds fine, but uh, I don't know what his food source is or whatever, so you're just going to like yeah. stick him on an asteroid and let him starve to death. I don't really know. She basically says, nope, change plans, bring him to Coruscant. Uh, There's further studying that needs to happen. Yeah, Anakin is basically like, yay, everybody wins. The creature is safe. Yeah. And Mace disagrees. Like, hey, let's hope that the same can be said for Coruscant. We yeah. see the then... Zillow Beast being lifted up <laughs> with, like, some ropes tied to <laughs> some lats. Four lats, yeah. Yeah, this doesn't look like a, an effective means of transportation, <laughs> but... Uh, the arms Q-Lat... start coming up. Yeah, we don't we don't see body lift off, but we definitely see arms individual. And I think individual. you see, like, the neck coming up, don't you? Like, they tied it around, Just... like, the neck, the wrist, like... and the ankles, and it's like, okay, yeah. let's go. Like, it's starting... Yeah, lift is happening, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's the very last shot. Cue loud then, music. Uh, cue loud music. So, yeah. For right. voice actors, we got uh, good old TC Terrence Carson as Mace. Or the Mace analog, maybe. Yeah. However you want to call that. Uh, Greg Baldwin, who I believe we talked about last week, is... Doge, Eurus, and all of the Dugs, apparently. Mm-hmm. Ian Abercrombie is Chancellor Palpatine, and I can't read my writing, but I believe this is Kara Pifko as yes. Dr. Bull. And in the credits, her first name is listed, Sian Burke. Ah, nice. I didn't even notice that. That's where the first name comes from, because... I don't know that we. I don't know that we see that anywhere else. No, she never gets named other than Doctor Bowl. Yeah, I'm wondering if she's in another episode, and uh, we are about like to find out. One that appears in release order before this one, maybe. Is that what you mean? Or chronologically after. Yeah, I I have no I mean I I have not looked any further forward so. But, she yeah. is in one other episode and uh we'll get to that one next week. So is that then yeah, I figured yeah. it'd be just the next one. Yep. Cuz uh cuz Palpatine the whole reason Palpatine wants to send it to Coruscant the Zilla Beast is to study it more and like try and figure out what's going on with its armor. And 
Dr. Bull was one of the proponents of studying the creature more as well. Yeah, because doesn't she make a comment like uh, his scale because the scale could be armor used. plating are like so strong like let's study it and study it and then replicate that in yeah shielding technology for ships and or clone troopers and then she was like yeah. Ooh, that is a good idea especially because anakin pointed out that his his saber couldn't penetrate mm-hmm. the armor so i mean i i understand that that standpoint for sure that that point is very sound to me mm-hmm. you know it's a natural reaction so Anyway, should we get into... I I agree it's a natural reaction, but I'm not sure that the location is uh, is correct. Surely, yeah. You know, in real estate, it's location, location, location. (laughs) uh, Hey, surely Coruscant has all the resources to study this, right? Absolutely. Of course that's that's the place. They got plenty of room. Right. You can can stick a 97-meter Zillow Beast anywhere. Yeah, like why, why would you go anywhere else, you know? So. They, sh- they should use uh, what is it, Dr. Vindy, what was his last name? The mad scientist on Naboo. They should oh, use his place. Like the, yeah. the thing's fucking underground. <laughs> You're good. And Naboo wouldn't be a bad place. Anyways. I mean, it wouldn't, probably wouldn't be a great place, but... Better than the city planet. That is true. The yeah. entire planet is one big city. Thank, thank you, Captain Exposition. Um, but uh, so, anyways, anyways let's thumbs wrap up, this thumbs up. down. You want to start? You want me to start? You decide. I'm giving this a solid thumbs up. I enjoyed this one. I am also giving this one a solid thumbs up. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed this one. I don't have. I don't even really have like a list of list of complaints to bring up. Oh, uh, yeah, nothing bothers me in this one really. Like, if, if there was, it just the story flows. We've got the repeated boardroom scenes, and uh, there is, you know, we don't have like an A plot, B plot problem. We do have yeah. a little bit of, uh, and I, I get why it's there because it's to like pump the brakes in between action moments. But uh, I mean, the biggest complaint that I have is like this treaty thing is fucking useless. Yeah, you know, it it's could definitely just a MacGuffin. Be, yeah, your your descriptor earlier is correct. It's definitely just there to give some reasoning to Palpatine's whatever, but I don't... Here's a yeah. reason. Uh, there's a fucking war going on, and the Separatists came in, and they're trying to just steal the fucking fuel, and yeah. they're just killing all these people and fucking wiping them out. And mm-hmm. so the Republic does what the Republic is supposed to do, and they defend their citizens yeah malastare shows up and malastare is part of the republic Mm -hmm. because it's in fucking maybe as far back as the phantom menace that because i think like the three-eyed uh alien things you know what i'm talking about i don't know sort of they're like malastarians maybe one of the other yeah one of the other pod racer guys right yeah mohonic yeah uh, I believe he's from Malastare, and I believe that there is a senator that is says something about with the, the three eyes things. Yeah, the senator from Malastare concurs with the guy from fucking <laughs> new gun race thing or whatever. Yeah, right. Nemoidia, so, right? With the Nemoidian representative, so they're already part of the republic. So the Republic should just come in and defend the planet. And if they yeah. already left the Republic, then this battle makes even less sense. Mm-hmm. Right? But then Palpatine's like, hey, welcome to the Republic. Like, I don't I don't know. It just seems... <sighs> Anytime they throw like, ooh, let's like throw a treaty in here, it feels like they're like, hey, George, <laughs> like, hey, another treaty. You like your yeah. treaties, buddy. Yeah, you like your political. Yeah, yeah. Like, if anything, um, I wish maybe they found a better way to, I don't know, tie it into a more. Because again, like, Ga- kaiju and Godzilla movies can be whatever you want, right? Like, like mm-hmm. I said, each of them serve different purposes. So, like I said, the first one is very 
responsive to the horrors of World War II. And then later on, they just become fun monster movies. And then with occasional ones kind of having something to say about real world applications. Right. Yeah. And then Shin Godzilla for sure has a fucking message that it wants to get a point, uh, uh, the point across to like all of Japan. Right. Like that one has a lot of shit to say about how government is run, governmental red tape, the speed at which government runs to help its people, like in the guise of a monster movie, right? So, this was is, any of was any of that mirrored in this episode? Yeah, so that's what I'm getting at. Like, I I wonder if there was a way to try and figure out, you know, if the monster could have stood for as an analogy for something rather than just being a monster that kind of shows up, right? Like, you know, maybe like if they had saved the Zillabies for maybe later when Anakin is kind of seeing more horrors from, um, the, the Republic or he's seeing more wrongs by the Jedi or the council and then the monster shows up and he sees it almost as an analogy for whatever is happening in, with the government right like that is a possibility is it necessary no this episode i think does still work as as is as far as like monster movies go the pacing is fine um the lead up to it i think is well done you know like before it starts smashing tanks right it doesn't start there it starts by just stomping on things Mm -hmm. and then it crawls out of the pit and then starts causing more mayhem you know i like that there was a progression for the zillow beast as well okay um so that but yeah so like in terms of story i think it's fine i'm just curious if there would have been another way to approach it but Mm -hmm. that's not a complaint you know it's just i think this is a good episode you know? Yeah, I think it's a solid can't, episode. Can't like say not that. even, yeah, because usually we've been like on the fence or whatever. No, I I really do enjoy this episode. Mm-hmm. Like I watched not, this not one. Even. and I was like, well, this is a thumbs up. No, no questions there. Now, yeah, you know, After, yeah. I sat there and I was like, yeah, I I have no complaints for this one. <laughs> yeah, like it's just a good, straightforward, good episode. I the jokes landed well. You know, nothing was there. Were, there were no duds, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, if I want to be nitpicky, which is what we do, um, you know, Mace Windu, I don't know. I don't know about this guy in the Clone Wars. Yeah, he seems to, the pressure's getting to him. That's how I'm seeing it. The pressure's getting to him. Okay. Yeah. That but that anyways. may op- that may open my eyes to a, a better way to view Mace yeah. because... Uh, my opinion is that he's just kind of, just kind of, like, hey, we need another, need another Jedi here. Mm-hmm. Hey, look, there's Mace. He doesn't do anything mm-hmm. except for sit around at the council, <laughs> right. tag along on missions. Like, we'll stick him in there. So, uh, you know, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how me and Mace get along moving forward. <laughs> Mister Windu. See. All right, but, anything uh, else to say before we uh, head on out of here? I don't think so. I think it's plug time, buddy. Yeah, Get. Uh, so what do we got? If you want to email us, notthenerdspodcast at gmail.com. You got it. Uh, please let us know what you think, if you have any questions or anything like that. Uh, you can also reach out to Kevin, who's in charge of our Twitter, at notthenerds. Uh, I'm in charge of the Facebook, at notthenerdspodcast there. Um, we also want to give a shout-out to uh kevin uh different kevin who did our artwork uh you can reach out to him on twitter at they call me k-dub and also Lindsay, who put together our uh musical jingle that shows up at the beginning and end of this episode uh at strange fantasy music at gmail.com you can reach her there if you want her to put something together for you yep um that's our quick run on all that stuff so please just let us know what you think of our show yeah and absolutely here um, it'd be nice if you could take the time to leave us a review on whatever podcatcher you are listening to, mm-hmm. uh, which would, what are we available on? iTunes, iTunes which is Apple Stitcher. Podcast now, Stitcher, TuneIn yeah. Radio. I feel yep, like there's something in. else. I don't really know. 
I think we're on Google Play. I need to double check that. Google Play. We haven't. Yeah. We haven't named that I, one. Yeah, in a I while. think we are. Yeah, we are. I believe we are on Google Play. Um, because I think early on you and I discussed where we would be linking people towards, but. Yep. Um, I think usually Apple is kind of the direction we go. Uh, but yeah, we're pretty much anywhere you can listen to podcasts, except for maybe like I don't know, SoundCloud might be the one we're missing, but that's not a really big one. So I'll have to look into that. Yeah, but uh, anyways, yeah, please let us know. Like, um, share, th- rate, subscribe. You know how it goes. Absolutely. I think with the release of it, this episode, uh, following this week is when Star Wars Resistance will begin airing. So we'd look out this... for that. Kevin and I are going to try and figure out how we're going to watch that show because neither of us have cable. Um, but also we will... Once we can get to it, start folding in, uh, talking in about Star Wars Resistance as well as they air, hopefully, um, if time works out well for Kevin and myself. Yep, we're going to figure out how to fold all this stuff in together and uh, keep the Clone Wars and the Resistance separate but equal. And, yes. And, uh, um, yeah. Yes. So, so you'll you still go. get a weekly dose of Clone Wars, even if we are talking about Resistance that week as well. So basically, they will be a, separate episodes. A double but up. Yeah. yeah. So. You'll you'll get more of Lorenzo's beautiful voice to <laughs> carry you into Star Wars bliss. And then we can have our own. Uh, we'll steal the uh, idea from James Bonding podcast as well, and let me go on that rant. Or uh, some some Godzilla thing. Once we can figure out how to watch all of them, <laughs> it happens. Yeah, we'll get you. We'll get you binging all the Godzilla movies at some point here, Kevin. I am not opposed to that. Yeah. So. So. Anyways, until next week. Until next week with the Zillow Beast Strikes Back. These aren't the nerds you're looking for.